Good morning. Thanks all for joining today. I'm here to talk about optics and AI clusters from Meta's perspective. I hope that we'll have a good conversation. I'll try not to talk too fast, but fast enough to leave some room for questions at the end, but of course I'll be here. I don't think anything in this chart is new. I think we've been talking about these sorts of things as an industry for quite some time now. I don't get a point of view. You're going to have to. Um, <clears throat> I think what I'll do today is try to talk about and motivate the growth of this model size. Why does the model continue to grow and what does that mean for I.O. and for the optical industry in general? The, the trend is, is clear. The trend isn't stopping. I think we had a gentleman from Google yesterday who spoke about this, I think, in some detail and quite eloquently. I, I will try to add some, some color to that same trend. As Vlad answered in that sort of last question, right? Why? What? What about PCIe over optics? Where is that going? I, I mean, I think PCIe over optics is the same as sort of any other phi. It's essentially increasing, doubling, maybe every two generation or every generation, every couple of years. Um, but but the requirements on the AIML model size certainly are growing significantly faster than that, right? I mean, two x every four months versus two x every twenty four months. So as a hardware industry, we're sort of falling behind the requirements or the desires I think that we have in the AI model size, which is causing the, the, the challenge I think we have as, as, um, as providers on our side. Uh, in the same trend, right, flops per GPU isn't increasing as quickly as we would like either. Um, same sort of physical trends are occurring there. And so we're, we're, we're seeing the, the, the opening gap between what we want to do or what we, we need to do to reach this sort of artificial general intelligence AGI inflection point or something. Uh, or increased or, or better LLM models. Uh, and so in order to, to be able to do that, we have to sort of innovate across the, the, the entire stack, right? This, this is the sort of call that I think Meta and others have to innovate software all the way down to hardware. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. This seems to be a new chart, and, and I'm surprised a bit because it's out there. I mean, this is sort of Wikipedia in general, but 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 in general, I think the message that, that people should be taking is larger models get better results, and we don't see an end to that trend. Uh, if that's the case, then we need larger models, and larger models trend to or require larger amounts of flops. So if you look at this curve here on the left, and you know, I'll point you to sort of this reference, Essentially, if you look at the number of, um, the amount of time you put into compute or flops, right? So flops per day, so length of time over a number of sort of compute, and you look at the loss signal, right? Your loss signal plateaus, meaning essentially for whatever given model size you had, you can get so good, but it doesn't matter how much longer you train it after that, that's as good as it gets. You have enough parameters and, and, and then you're sort of done. Um, and so our goal, of course, is to get the best test loss possible, the best model possible. And so given the fact that we can't train our models, well, it doesn't matter how long you train your model. At some point, you reach an, asympt an asymptote. Uh, the question is really, how do you get more parameters in your model? How much data can you get into your model to get better results and, and hence the, the better result at the end? It turns out in the end that the loss is inversely proportional to the size of the data set and the number of parameters that you put into it. Uh, and the compute is linearly um, related to the size of the data set and the number of parameters. So we want more parameters, we want bigger data sets, so we get better results, and that requires more compute. I mean, it's essentially that simple, and I'd encourage you to sort of look at this. But really what that means is, as providers, what we need is flops. We need more compute to be able to get these models trained faster, to be able to get the results out faster, to build onto the next data set. But flops obviously change the, the AI cluster design, and they have significant implications on the amount of I.O. that we need. On top of that, I mean, the, the previous chart really is, this is a training chart, right? Sort of built, I think, loosely on the chinchilla model from Google. So this, this is how we sort of train the large language models, Llama 2, Llama 3, and, and all the Palms and, and chat GPTs. However, training, I think, as, as those of us in the AI industry sort of know or are learning, is only a single portion of the entire sort of stack or value proposition oops, that we provide. Um, there's, there's obviously large language model training, which sort of results in these, these models, but then we have to use them, right? When you put your query in, it has to be sort of consumed and then it has to be sort of spit out. Those are the, the, um, the 
the, the infill and the, and the decode essentially, right? The sort of inference portion of, of, the, of the stack. And you can see how they put on different, different strains on the AI network that we put together. Uh, in the ideal world, we would have one set of hardware which would be reconfigurable to meet all of these things. If we had needed a new GPU or a new AI cluster for every single one of these, and you end up bifurcating sort of your investment. So, so this sense of complexity across the stack, both for large language models, but also for some of Meta's workloads like ranking and, and, and um, recommendation, push us to have more flexibility in our AI cluster design and by extension the hardware design, which sort of feeds in the end to to more efficient capital investment across our stack, which is, of course, always a good thing from our perspective. Maybe, maybe not from the hardware perspective. <laughs> That's what we want. So, it's, okay, here we are. We want more flops, which means we want more GPUs, right? We want more GPUs across the entire cluster, and we would like some sort of flexibility in that to meet the diversity of workloads across the training and the inference stack. Um, the, these clusters, and I think you know, Vlad showed some nice pictures from NVIDIA, and I think those are, those are I, would, I would reference those and continue to encourage people to look at you know, the publicity that NVIDIA's put out around their designs as, as very good reference points. You end up with connectivity models or sort of architectures which look loosely like this, meaning in general you have a bunch of GPUs very tightly coupled within a rack or in subsections of a rack, potentially even between racks. Then you build a, a scale out connectivity cluster on top of that. In general, this will be things like the InfiniBand and the Rocky types of, of inter, uh, interconnects. And the scale up will be this sort of uh, in, uh, uh, AXL or, or, um, or NVLink type of connections. And then on, on top of that, of course, we need a sort of a front end network. This is the sort of network which connects us not only to the data, but to the rest of the world so that we can pull things out. So there's quite a lot of sort of data being pushed across here. I think the important thing to understand is that the data sets and the model parameters are so large right now, they don't fit on individual GPUs anymore. And so what we try and do as a community is figure out how to shard this data across different collections of our stack in order to train faster, train better, train with less data, become more efficient, sort of bend the curve a little bit so it doesn't become linear with the data set. Uh, in general, that means that some of these parallelizations will drive the amount of bandwidth required in scale out networks, or these InfiniBand ones, where some will drive the scale up network. So those are sort of connections within the rack, you can think. Generally, any one of these single vectors sort of gives us an N scaling law, which means if you get N sort of GPUs in the scale up network, the scale out network is, a, is an nth of that sort of fabric. So LOPS drives IO, but you know, close, um, copper-based in general, sort of NVLink type bandwidth, drives down the bandwidth required in the upper levels of the network. But everything's scaling. So flops per accelerator really in the end drives up these sort of synchronization steps and more data creates more data. More data per unit time is more bandwidth and so these sort of scale up re um, requirements or higher flops in each accelerator then drives up the IO bandwidth per GPU. Whereas these larger number of GPUs across the cluster drives up sort of the number of links, so it drives radix and the number of links that we have to put out there. But in general, both of these are going up, so we need more links and we need faster links. So sort of you know music, I hope to the to the hardware industry's ears. And moving forward, there we go. I'm trying to call myself to account here and, and admit to the fact that my crystal ball is maybe a little bit better than, than Vlad's for at least Meta's applications, but it's not perfect either. This is the type of slide that, that I had been showing last year, sort of significantly, trying to give a concept of where we saw the sort of sets of requirements um, being needed across a, a single GPU node, and I'm going to sort of call myself out and show you where I missed. The idea here being that AI ML uh, GPU nodes aren't, aren't monolithic anymore. And, and you know, we've seen the Grace Blackwell uh, announcements from NVIDIA and from Jensen, and, and you know, clearly that, that, that's true now. We're gonna need more uh, HBM, so more HBM stacks across that. And what we saw, at least last year, was that network GPU, so this is a sort of scale up and scale out network, was on the order of 900 gigabytes per second. Um, you know, 18, 400 gigabit per second sort of logical links, you know, distributed through copper and optics. 
Uh, but scaling, you know, if you thought 50% generation over generation, we were going to get to two terabytes per second per GPU, you know, pretty soon. GPU to GPU, this is the sort of PCIe fabric, you know, fractions of a terabyte, but still, you know, not insignificant. And then these uh, GPU to HBM links are trending to, well, certainly being deployed now at a terabyte per second per stack, and there's multiple of these stacks. So each one of these GPU cores has a very, very significant amount of, of bandwidth, and I'm suggesting 10 terabytes per second, and, you know, boy, that, isn't that scary? That's a lot of I.O. So, okay, so, so let's look at this a little more carefully, right? I mean, they're no longer monolithic. That, that's absolutely true. In fact, as we've seen from the Grace Blackwell design, that it's not only sort of single GPUs anymore. There's multiple GPU dies in a single package, which means that now there's GPU to GPU communications with inside the package as well. So if we were going to account for all the I.O., it's exploding, right? Um, certainly more HBM stacks. Wow, you know, that, that wasn't sort of uh, too significant a call, but even so. Uh, the the I/O bandwidth massively undercalled, right? I'm going to give myself a real sort of thumbs down on, on that one. Here we are talking about 900 gigabits per second, you know, maybe trending to two, and Jensen's already announced four terabytes per second per accelerator. So undercalled by two x in sort of half a year, a year's worth of sort of uh, trending here. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about GPU to CPU. I don't, I don't know that came out too clearly in what Grace Blackwell is, but I can tell you that it's much more significant here than this sort of PCI link. So I don't think we're clear there either. And, you know, GPU to HBM, I'm going to give that a sort of plus. Certainly more is better, but it's trending to 16 terabytes per second per accelerator, um, at least from the if we count one package as one accelerator. So we've already got 16 terabytes per second. And so he, here where I am thinking, oh, you know, I'm scaring people by talking about 10 terabytes per second per package in the next couple of generations. And we're exceeding that significantly already uh, with the latest announcements of 22 terabytes per second per accelerator in the Grace Blackwell generation, which is essentially targeted for mass production next year. So, okay, uh, not, not so great. So here I am thinking 16,000 GPUs, that was what Meta had announced last year in a, in a single cluster, you know, 10 terabytes per second for, for each accelerator was going to push us to 160 petabytes per second per cluster, which is a staggering amount of data. And again, massively undercalled, right? 24,000 nodes per cluster is what we announced just a few weeks ago, and that's a small step on the path of sort of where we're going. And at significantly more than, you know, 10 terabytes per second per accelerator, we're going to massively blow through that as well. So the amount of I.O. that's needed just in the next generation, which, which is, this goes back to sort of Lad's comments and some of the questions, the next generation's designed. You've seen the design. It's based on sort of known technologies and copper and sort of optics where it needs to be. Um, we're designing the generations after that right now, which have to be orders of magnitude better than this to sort of meet the trend. So the, the I.O. fabric demands are, are truly significant. Um, Meta has announced, and I would push you or, or uh, show you towards this sort of link here, uh, two 24,000 GPU clusters uh, just in the last few weeks. You can see the details here. There's one cluster based on Rocky, one cluster based on InfiniBand. <coughs> We've published details on the hardware, the network stores, design performance, and software for various uh, portions of these, these workloads, and we're training the Llama 3 models on this now. Um, th so, so this is based on previous <coughs> hardware, not sort of the Grace Blackwell we, that we talked about previously. Um, Meta, as a you know, longtime sponsor, I think, and, and a co-innovator around OCP, continues to be strongly committed to this sort of open community here, right? And so, you know, we built these clusters on the Grand Teton Open Rack and PyTorch uh, technologies that we've published uh, and, and shared specs with at OCP, and we continue to sort of push this innovation and collaboration to ensure that we can meet these requirements moving forward. Uh, and, and I suppose the really important thing to understand is that 24,000 node clusters this year don't mean that we're going to top out at 24,000 node clusters. We're going further than that. The models need to be bigger to meet the sort of requirements that we need. Um, we're, we're, we're really, you know, at a, at a very early and exciting portion of the entire sort of LLM and, and AGI journey, right? Um, we, we need larger software models. We need larger training sets. We need sort of more innovation to try and bend this curve so that we don't have to be up at, you know, planet-sized sort of GPU clusters <laughs> to create AGI. 
Um, but these demands uh, to push for more flops are going to require more I.O. And as Lad sort of talked about before, right, the more I.O. you need, the more uh, investment you need across the size of these clusters, the more efficiency matters. Efficiency matters in area, efficiency matters in power, efficiency matters in dollars, efficiency matters in latency. All of these things that sort of have to be innovated on aggressively in order to create these large clusters to, to meet the requirements and demands that we have. Uh, and then I, I'll, I'll sort of hit this one again. There's innovation across the entire stack. Software, um, the, you know, model parameters, uh, uh, compression of the models, compression of inference, uh, software paradigms, memory architectures, uh, system IO, et, et cetera. And we're going to continue to innovate across all of that. The hardware and the optical hardware and, and IO is, is a part of that sort of discussion. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. So thanks very much. Hi, good morning, uh, Philippe Bordestel. Uh, just a question, uh, with the evolution here and uh, learning, uh, as I said one month ago, it was OFC and uh, in the executive forum uh, of Optica, uh, it was clear that CPO was far away to be ready, you know, for the requirement of the market. And with the speed of the evolution we go today, how do you see the impact as the optics is not ready to follow the speed of the higher level? Um, so, so let me try and, and repeat back and then answer, right? I mean, so what's the impact of optics not being able to sort of meet the speed requirements or, or the demands of, of the requirements? Um, quite frankly, that means that we'll re-architect around it. I mean, there was a, a famous phrase sort of used back in the day, right? Don't shoot behind the duck. Um, which means essentially, right, I think this is very important in a sort of new technology. If Lad's right and the first OFC demo is two years away from mass production and then you have to do HVM sort of, sort of scale up past then, it means really you're three years from your first demonstration to the point at which you can meet the volume demands that we require to put out these large clusters very, very quickly. How long does it take you from where we are now to the first OFC demo? One year? Two years? So, so you're talking about a development cycle which is four or five years out. My crystal ball was sort of wrong, right, a year out. Vlad's, you know, maybe is more accurate because he's, he's been doing it better and longer. For, and it, but he's only got sort of two years and he costs beyond that. So if you're looking at a development cycle where you're starting with a new technology and, you, and you, you know, you have to innovate from there, you should be looking at what you think the targets are five years out. Otherwise, you're shooting behind the duck and you'll miss it. The only other point uh, I'll make, right, and this goes back to the, the comment I think Hong made about sort of opt CPO optics is always sort of two years out. The, you know, the decisions that we're making on the sort of next gen clusters have been made last year. And the ones that we're making about sort of clusters from two years or three years from now are sort of being made now. And so if your new technology is sort of coming now and you think it's going to be ready in three years, I, I can't bet on that. We can't bet on that for the next cluster. Right? We, we, can't, we can't put however many billions of marks dollars into this cluster and hope that some optics will sort of work sometime. Right? Regardless of also the reliability associated with actually running the thing, it has to be deployed, it has to be bomber. So we need optics earlier, which means we need sort of co-investment, co-discussion around where the technology is, how mature it is, how scalable to volume it is, and how well it can be sort of operated and, and serviced in these large clusters in order to be able to build on it. So I, I guess my, my comment is, however much I.O. you think you need, sort of multiply it by five or ten, and let's get it ready earlier so that we can have these discussions and make it real. But I hope it will be a snowball effect, right? Once we get it done once, and everybody will start to see, but, but it's faster, lower power, more efficient. That's what we need. All right, let us thank the speaker one more time.